Brett Wagner, and I'll be your host. Today's episode is on estranged labor. Now, estranged labor is a Marxist concept, and there's a particular piece of writing that Marx did in the Philosophic and Economic Manuscripts called Estranged Labor, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Very similar to our Engels Burial Speech video, we'll be doing a reading of this and looking at some commentary on it. In something that's different from the Engels Burial Speech video, I'm going to put the commentary in the reading itself. So I'll read a little bit, give a commentary, read a little bit, give a commentary, and uh, hopefully guide you through a reading of the document Estranged Labor. There's also a little bit of background that you need to know for this. So um, when Marx is writing in this manuscript at this point, he's already explained surplus value, he's already explained exploitation. And so when he writes these things, he's writing about capitalist property relations, um, given that you already know about surplus value and exploitation and all of those things, because this takes that as assumed so you'll you should familiarize yourself with that if you don't know it already before listening to this so this is estranged labor we have proceeded from the premises of political economy we have accepted its language and its laws we have presumed private property the separation of labor capital and land and of wages profit of capital and rent of land Likewise, division of labor, competition, the concept of exchange value, etc. On the basis of political economy itself, in its own words, we have shown that the worker sinks to the level of a commodity, and becomes indeed the most wretched of commodities, that the wretchedness of the worker is in inverse proportion to the power and magnitude of his production, that the necessary result of competition is the accumulation of capital in a few hands, and thus the restoration of monopoly in more terrible form, and that finally the distinction between capitalist and land rentier, like the uh, like that between the tiller of the soil and the factory worker, disappears, and that the whole of society must fall apart into the two classes, property owners and propertyless workers. That's a quick summary of what he's already written about. Political economy starts with the fact of private property. It does not explain it to us. It expresses in general abstract formulas, the material processes through which private property actually passes, and these formulas it then takes for laws. It does not comprehend these laws, i.e. it does not demonstrate how they arise from the very nature of private property. Political economy throws no light on the cause of the division between labor and capital, and between capital and land. When, for example, it defines the relationship of wages to profit, it takes the interest of the capitalist to be ultimate cause. It takes for granted what it is supposed to explain. Similarly, competition comes in everywhere. It is explained from external circumstances. As to how far these external and apparently accidental circumstances are but the expression of necessary course of development, political economy teaches us nothing. We have seen how exchange itself appears to it as an accidental fact. The only wheels which political economy sets in motion are greed, and the war amongst the greedy competition. So in that paragraph, Marx is just telling us uh, that traditional political economy, the political economists that came before him, really didn't get at a lot of the core explanations of capital that he finds. Precisely because political economy does not grasp the way the movement is connected, it was possible to oppose, for instance, the doctrine of competition to the doctrine of monopoly, the doctrine of craft freedom to the doctrine of the guild, the doctrine of the division of landed property to the doctrine of the big estate. For competition, freedom of the crafts and the division of landed property were explained and comprehended only as accidental, premeditated, and violent causes of monopoly of the guild system of feudal property and not as their necessary, inevitable, and natural consequences. Okay, here Marx is opposing uh, feudalism to capitalism and saying that 
traditional political economist says that it just was kind of an accident that it happened and all of these things just kind of came together where Marx sees the tradi- transition from feudalism to capitalism as a type of evolution of human society as a step forward uh, that kind of came about necessarily if feudalism exists for long enough it will eventually create capitalism now therefore we have to grasp the intrinsic connection between private property greed, the separation of labor, capital, and landed property, the connection of exchange and competition, of value and devaluation of man, of monopoly and competition, etc., the whole connection between this whole estrangement and the money system. By estrangement, Marx means alienation, so we're going to be looking at how alienation fits into the whole system of capitalism. Do not let us go back to a fictitious primordial condition as the political economist does when he tries to explain. Such a primordial condition explains nothing. It merely pushes the question away into a gray nebulous distance. The economist assumes in the form of a fact of an event that he is supposed to deduce, namely the necessary relationship between two things, between, for example, division of labor and exchange. Thus, the theologian explains the origin of evil, by the fall of man, that this he assumes as a fact in historical form what has to be explained. We proceed from an actual economic fact. What Marx is talking about here about the fictitious primordial condition is this thing that political economists would like to evoke in order to explain something. So it would be Robinson Crusoe on his island and how he produces things for himself. Marx is saying, this doesn't really work because that's not how the world is. The world is not a whole bunch of isolated people only doing things for themselves. We work in relation to other people. And so that's the actual economic fact. And that's where we're going to be proceeding from, real life. The worker becomes the poorer, the more wealth he produces. The more his production increases in power and size. The worker becomes an even cheaper commodity the more commodities he creates. The devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things. Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself, and the worker as a commodity. And this is at the same rate at which it produces commodities in general. This is a little um, contradictory in certain ways, or may appear contradictory. How can a worker become poorer when he creates more? This is taking the assumption of exploitation. So if a worker produces more, his wages don't necessarily increase. He just makes more for his boss, for the capitalist. And so in relation to the capitalist, he becomes poorer and poorer because he makes more and more. So by making more, the worker becomes poorer. This fact expresses merely that the object which labor produces, labor's product, confronts it as something alien, as a power independent of the producer. The product of labor is labor which has been embodied in an object, which has become material. It is the objectification of labor. Labor's realization is its objectification. Under these economic conditions, this realization of labor appears as loss of realization for the workers. Object, objectification as the loss of the object and bondage to it. Appropriation as estrangement, as alienation. So here Marx is moving into the first type of alienation he'll be talking about. There'll be four types in total. He's talking about how workers are alienated from the products of their labor. And this is what we talked about earlier in an earlier episode of Marxism Today. In this paragraph that we just covered... He shows how when we labor, we put in, we turn our labor, we turn our being, our energy, our muscles, our mind into a thing. And when we're separated from that thing, as in wage labor, the workers don't get to keep what they've made. There's no reason the boss would pay them to do that. So the boss gets those things. The capitalist, the corporation uh, gets those products. And so... When the workers put their work into those products, it's like they're being appropriated. They're being alienated from what they've, their selves, that that thing that they've made, whatever it is, uh, 
you know, a meal, a hamburger, a shirt, shoes, whatever, a software program, they have put themselves into it and then they're separated from it. And in that sense, they're alienated. So much does the labor's realization appear as a loss of realization that the worker loses realization to the point of starving to death. So much does the objectification appear as a loss of the object that the worker is robbed of the objects most necessary, not only for his life but for his work. Indeed, labor itself becomes an object which he can only obtain with the greatest effort and the most irregular interruptions. So much does the appropriation of the object appear as estrangement that the more objects the worker produces, the less he can possess, and the more he falls under the sway of his product, capital. All these consequences are implied in the statement that the worker is related to the product of labor as to an alien object. For on this premise it is clear that the more the worker spends himself, the more powerful becomes the alien world of objects which he creates over and against himself. The poorer he himself, his inner world becomes, the less belongings are to him as his own. It is the same in religion. The more man puts into God, the less he retains in himself. The worker puts his life into the object, but now his life no longer belongs to him, but to the object. Hence, the greater this activity, the more the worker lacks objects. Whatever the product of his labor is, he is not. Therefore, the greater this product, the less is he himself. The alienation of the worker in his product means not only that his labor becomes an object, an external existence, but that it exists outside of him, independently, as something alien to him, and that it becomes a power on its own confronting him. It means that the life which he has conferred on the object confronts him as something hostile and alien. So you may have experienced this on your own. Uh, if you've worked at some place that you didn't particularly care for, where the thing you have to do with your labor uh, seems to take you over. It, maybe you uh, had to make burgers for a fast food joint, and then you get to the point where you hate making these burgers because these burgers control your life. They're just more and more of them are ordered, and you have to work more and more. And it's completely out of your control. You don't feel like you control the burgers that you've made. You feel in a certain way that those burgers are controlling you. And we'll end our episode there. Uh, we'll have several other episodes following this one that will finish up the estranged labor document. We're only into the first part right now. And in this document, we'll, we will see three other ways that workers are alienated and it's really three different things that they're alienated from the first is the products of their labor and we'll talk a little bit about that more next time but we'll be focusing on the next thing that they're alienated from so stay tuned for that i'll see you next time thanks for tuning in This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.